So thanks everyone for so much for coming. It's, it's so exciting. We've been working so hard on the conference to see everyone's smiling face out here um, and making it real. So I, I wanted to um, start out by talking about how I came to this idea of partnerships and some of the things that I've learned in trying to make these partnerships both in the for-profit and not-for-profit sector and then to kind of pick up on Josh's points, some of the specific ways that we're here at Stanford trying to address some of the challenges that Josh raised about making partnerships um, effective. Um, we're young, uh, it's a work in progress, so actually feedback and learning by doing will be very appreciated. So I, I started thinking about um, you know, academic uh, industry collaborations in 2007. Um, I was invited to be uh, consulting chief economist of Microsoft, and I spent a lot of time in the search engine and specifically in the, in the advertising side. And so I actually had sort of a very operational role there. We were trying to you know, design the A-B testing platform, figure out the metrics, um, you know, just figure out all the parts about trying to make a search engine not lose billions of dollars a year. Um, and along, along the way, I was realizing how much value different aspects of my academic background had in this problem because so many things we were doing, we were doing for the first time. When you try to figure out what exactly, what should success look like? How, what, you're gonna do everything through A-B testing, but how do the measures actually reflect um, the, your eventual goals as a business? Those types of questions were, were challenging. And then also, there were lots of different kinds of technical and auction issues that came up along the way. Um, we, we, I was thinking about how we could best you know, leverage all of the great um, research insight that was out there um, for this problem and I, I also realized I was learning so much, and so many of my colleagues would be really grateful for the opportunity to learn about everything from machine learning to A-B testing and so on, but making that match was very difficult. So at Microsoft, um, we did a couple of things. One thing is we, we started this, um, a, a, a new lab in the Microsoft Research Organization in Cambridge, and they're a co-sponsor of the conference. Some of the folks are, are here today, and also hired economists into the business as well. But one of the things in the, in the lab, I spent a lot of time early on trying to understand how, how could the academics be beneficial? When were they good? When were they bad? Um, and also, when did they need to go outside the lab and, and, and get academic partnerships? And so some of the things that I, I realized there was it was really helpful to have a portfolio of people. So if you're gonna drag a business person into the meeting to share their problem, if you just have one potential partner on the other side, you'll get into this issue that you know, the, the, the person in the room has a hammer and they're just looking to see if the, this is a nail and the conversations can waste a lot of time and be frustrating. But if you actually have a suite of people in the room plus somebody in the room who really is connected to a wider range of expertise, you can assess the problem and sort of play this um, in-between role and then bring in just the right person. And so then the business partner just you know, doesn't know how this magic happened, but the next meeting you present them with you know, the person perfect collection of people to address the problem. Um, another challenge is trying to though, align the incentives and thinking about um, you know, publication and so on. You know, partly with a for-profit business, that can be challenging to solve, which is part of the reason that Microsoft has an internal lab, and so you would be kind of mixing up, uh, you would get a little bit of learning from doing the like, consulting project, and then you would go and do something related in your published research. In some cases, we could have the alignment, like studying things like news, where it was, there was less of a, of a conflict, but generally that publication side of things um, could be tricky, and worrying about intellectual property and things like that was, was sometimes a blocker in terms of getting this going. Um, but we also, over time, figured out a bunch of tactics that worked. Like we, we started a pre-doctoral research program, which was very successful. I ended up with actually four or five students that were the top of the economics job market later who came through that pre-doc program, so I was very proud of that. Um, but the, what those pre-doctoral uh, students did is they came in and became really specialists in the data inside of Microsoft. And so then if I, we collaborated with an external academic, a lot of the startup costs could be reduced, and that was one way that I could recruit the very best academics to collaborate with Microsoft, was that I could say, hey, this is gonna be easy for you. You, know, you can just come in and do the part you're specialized in, and you don't have to invest a year figuring it out with the risk that something will go wrong and the data won't work or anything else. So that really helped me, I think, to, to try to help us recruit some of the best people. So these were all things that were exciting, and Microsoft was well set up to publish because it already had Microsoft Research and so on. As I, after I kind of spent many delightful years doing that and started moving on, on, on to new types of collaborations, 
I was struggling to figure out you know, how to make that work um, when, once I didn't have the long-term relationship. And one of the things I had really valued in the Microsoft experience was that because I got to know them so well, I always knew exactly what the important problems were. I had a lot of confidence in, in what I was doing was adding value. And I could tackle more ambitious things because I had that trust. And, and they knew that I would make good decisions. And so we had this trust that I could actually try things that were more complex. And then I thought, well, if, once I'm in more in my, my academic role again, how, how will I make that work? And so I, I was in the process of trying to you know, do these diff start different collaborations on my own. Um, and then actually uh, Tom Khalil, who's here, came into my life um, and started talking to me about uh, ways that you know, I could scale up uh, social impact work. And so he was really influential in helping me think bigger. And I, I got a generous gift from Schmidt Futures. And so a couple of years ago, we started trying to do more um, of these social impact collaborations at scale. And so I'll now um, talk through some of the things that, that we've been thinking about that. One of the big opportunities, this, this isn't exhaustive, but just to kind of make things concrete, one of the big opportunities that, that I see, and I know many of you see, is that when we're trying to help um, disadvantaged individuals, we really need to meet them where they are. Um, the time is one of the biggest costs. I mean, we've had free Khan Academy for a long time now. There's lots of good content out there. You know, Halvarian very eloquently talks about the billion views a day on YouTube of how-to videos, but at some level, that's still not solving people's problems in terms of getting better education, especially the people who we think might need it most. But of course, the advent of mobile has given us the chance to meet people where they are, whether it's in the train, while it's sitting in the floor of a dark room while your child isn't quite asleep yet, um, whether it's you know, um, in between things while you're waiting in line. So the ability of mobile to allow you to use people's time in a much more efficient way, I think just by itself, should lead to a renewed effort to try to create content. But then in that setting, in some sense, the success of YouTube tells us a lot. It's very engaging. You can get it in really short snippets. You can kind of go from one thing to the other. You don't have to work too hard. It's just that generally, like at least for my kids, that's leading you down the path of more videos about silly pranks that people do. Um, <laughs> and so can we, can we try to use what we've learned, that we've gotten really good at seducing people into spending time uh, in, a, in short, engaging clips? Um, but actually, I'm, you know, my kids also like it when they get History Channel stuff. It's just that there's not that much of that stuff, and they pretty soon get diverted back to the pranks again. So, you know, the, but, the, but I think we've proved that we can engage people with interesting content. It's just that, and meet them where they are, and they can actually put in a lot of time in a day finding time where you wouldn't have otherwise thought it. And then the last thing is the, the personalization. So as many of you know, although there's a lot of discussion in, say, the ed tech space about you know, how everything's AI powered and so on, when you really dig in, the kind of personalization that's actually there is generally like a kind of a pre-programmed personalization. We've thought a lot about the sequence of learning that people should do, but we have much less um, in practice that actually is adapting to the individual. So again, just as an anecdote, one of, my, one of my kids did all their math in Khan Academy last year, but hated the videos, so never watched a single video. Um, now they learned in, you know, all of geometry from just going to the tests and sort of guessing and, and then learning to, to do the proofs. Um, this, is, you know, this is maybe not a bad way to learn geometry, but if you knew you were going to go that way, you might have created the tests a little bit differently and provided other types of learning experiences. And so this ability to really meet people where they are in terms of their learning styles um, just, you know, it seems very important. We, we have a lot of evidence that that's true when we do it in the analog world, but it's just been very hard to scale that, and technology allows that a chance to scale. So we have these opportunities, um, but then, and then when we go to actually try to make this work, of course, because we haven't really tried to do it digitally at scale before, there's going to be a lot of learning. Um, and so one of the things that can be really helpful in this space is to start from the beginning creating a culture of measurement and incremental improvement that attracts investment. And so it's, when, when I think about how that works in practice, um, if you are using best practices in tech, you are architecting your system from the beginning to do randomized controlled tests. Now, of course, not everybody does that. And in the for-profit world, as in the non-for-profit world, that's not perfect. But that's becoming more and more 
standard practice, especially as we get more and more um, services that are easy for people to adopt, and also as more and more of the startup people have come from companies where they, the A-B testing was part of the culture. Once we have that culture of measurement and incremental improvement, the idea is that you're actually going to be much easier for firms to demonstrate their impact to funders because they're measuring it on a daily basis. And then in turn, that can um, lead the sector to get more investment. And then finally, we want to think about you know, the generalizable best practices and methods that can guide future innovation. So A-B testing, it's, 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 it's exciting to talk about AI now, but really, the, the, to me, actually, A-B testing is a, is a more important innovation than AI and much more empirically important right now in terms of what people are doing. But this collection of practices, this tech firm toolkit of um, using data-driven innovation uh, is something that, that is really a general purpose technology. I can take it from a search engine to an ed tech company, to an, a workforce startup, to a financial services firm. And I'm talking to all these firms in the for-profit and for pro not-for-profit world, and there's just a lot of generalizable insights about the practices. And then further, when you're doing that kind of experimentation, it's also um, very natural to learn about um, mechanisms as well. And so some of the innovations that I brought to the search engine at Microsoft included um, ex post analysis of the A-B testing platform to try to understand the mechanisms. So even though tech firms do a lot of A-B testing, there's often just did this work or did this not work, and, and still less on how can I, in a, in a very automated, easy way, pull up the insights for why it worked from the data from that experiment. So that's been a big focus of, of my um, academic research is developing good statistical methods to do that. Um, now, when I think about what, what, what actually takes to bring all these things to practice, you know, I'm spending a lot of time writing research papers and publishing them in, in computer science journals and economics journals and statistics journals, bringing the methods forward. But honestly, that's not the gating factor to success. Um, the most important things about success to, to learn how to make all of this work is actually to put the things into practice. It was only actually by going to practice that I knew what the open questions were for statistics and machine learning. So to me, the, 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 the way that the best research should be done is you go to the problem and you see where your tools don't work or you see where people are systematically having trouble and develop the tools that meet that. And so that's really the way, it, so to me, there's an alignment, like this misalignment between, oh, the researcher wants to do X and the companies want to do Y. In a lot of these areas right now, I don't see that misalignment. I see that the only way you will really do great research is if you're out there in the field seeing what the problems are and developing um, solutions for that. But in order to do that, um, as Josh said, you need to reach a target audience. I can't, I have to be interacting with users to be able to understand both what behavioral interventions work as well as what um, methodologies, statistical methodologies work. Um, I already mentioned one of the other really big things that, that where I think social scientists play a really important role is just actually figuring out what to measure. And I think this is underappreciated. You know, we put a thousand people through our machine learning course and they learn, you know, this is a random forest, this is a neural net and so on, but they're then downloading data sets off of the web and the Y is given and the X is given and they're using X to predict Y. Well, a lot of what social scientists think about is what do we want to do here, and how can I map what we want to do into an operational measure? And honestly, Microsoft hired me because I was an auction theorist and a, and a marketplace designer and a platform economist, but the biggest impact I had was changing what they measured um, and making it better match their objectives and coming up with things that really captured their interest. And so that, that's, um, that's a huge part of what goes on. There's also, just related to that, something that I, I've worked with a lot of companies on and governments as well, is trying to come up with measures that can be measured in the right time frame. So we have a research agenda on surrogates, which is basically a way to take short-term measures and translate them into long-term outcomes. Um, I worked on that at Microsoft in trying to get away from just measuring clicks, which led them, which had created the incentive to put up a bunch of crappy ads. Um, and instead uh, use things like dwell time that, and, and, and scale them in a way that they approximated future conversions. And that measure as a, as a guiding force for the A-B testing platform then allowed them to see that it was actually more beneficial to get rid of ads rather than keep putting up double the number of ads that Google did. Um, in, the, in the paper with Raj Chetty, that we've been working on in the, in, in the sort of government uh, sector, we're looking at government training programs, 
And so we've been working on measuring the impact of a training program. That's gonna, gonna be high for a few quarters and then it's gonna sort of taper off again. If you wanna measure the aggregate impact, you might have to wait several years to see the full impact and also to understand how much of it dissipates. But what we found is that by, if we created a prediction of the final impact using the first six quarters, that, that prediction that combined all the information from the first six quarters would provide just as reliable an indicator of the, app, of the overall impact as waiting several more years to get the final answer. And so the, the, it's just, there's a bunch of statistical issues in coming up with exactly how you do that. Um, and we've been working on that in research and also companies like Amazon are um, deploying those types of approaches um, in practice. But a lot of the problems with doing that is that if you pick intermediate metrics, sometimes you can end up sort of teaching to the test. Um, so just as an example how that can go wrong, if you're trying to measure an email campaign, uh, and you, one option might be to wait four months to see if people actually do the thing you want them to do. This particular application for me was in the for-profit sector, so you wanted somebody to buy something. Um, if you, you can wait four months to see if people buy something, or you can just say, oh, you know, 25% of the people who open an email buy something. But if you switch to measuring for email open rate, guess what happens? You know, over the course of a month, your email open rate goes from 25% to 5% because you keep selecting all these catchy, misleading headlines that don't actually uh, represent your final outcome. So there's actually a lot of thinking about incentives and the domain to, to p figure out you know, what's a good way to use a short-term variable and what's a bad way. And you might think this is like just a small potatoes, but in the, in the search engine, this, was, this created like massive inefficiencies um, if you use the wrong measures. Um, and then of course, understanding the broader context of institutions helps all of that. So when I think about university collaborations, I, another question is like, why is this efficient? So maybe industry people don't think like economists. Economists always ask why are things efficient and why doesn't the private sector do everything? It may be obvious to those of you not from economics. But what, some of the big benefits, academics can scale up and down easily. So this, I think this applies to both government and to, um, to the tech sector. If the government wants to do something, I think Justine Hastings is gonna to talk tomorrow when I think she has this lab it, called Ripple that is using administrative data in Rhode Island to, do, to do, make a lot of improvements to services. You say, why doesn't the government just do that? But of course, Justine can get much better people. She can scale up and down very quickly. She can, she can pivot toward, away from things. If, if you know, one department is having a, a technical problem, an IT disaster, she can pivot to another department in a way that the, that the government just can't do. And then, of course, once that's get proved, eventually, great, maybe every state will have a version of Ripple in-house and it'll be a great thing. But by proving it out and show, figuring out exactly how to do it in a much more flexible way, um, that's much more efficient. And also, of course, a lot of us have our time free. I mean, somebody else is paying our time and we're gonna, we might use it you know, proving theorems or doing some technical thing or we can use it to have impact and that's our choice. And in fact, a lot of us really value these collaborations because we are spending too much time writing papers just for other people to read and, and we get a lot of utility from having real impact. Another thing I mentioned is just specializing in conceptualizing new problems. And so that was a big deal in the search engine when the search engine was new. And now as we go out to ed tech and workforce, there's just a lot of things that need to be conceptualized and figured out. The students um, benefit and postdocs benefit from hands-on training. So teaching, again, uses worked over data sets. And most, most students are learning about things where there's no possibility they're gonna discover anything new. People have downloaded this image data set or this other data set. A thousand papers have been written. There's just nothing new to, to learn there. And it's so much more motivating and exciting to look at a data set people haven't looked at before in a place where they're, they're, they would actually have impact. And of course, those of them who are going into the private sector, the market rightly values real world experience. They are also figuring out that just hiring someone who's done a bunch of stuff downloading data sets off the web does not make them ready to go and, and have the real world impact. And so that, that kind of training is incredibly valuable. Now you say, well, why don't the firms just get the interns and, and solve the problem that way? But of course, it's very difficult for firms to supervise interns. It takes as much time to manage them and screen them as it does to, to get the benefit out of them. And so, but it's the faculty who know who students are good and also um, can supervise them because they're doing that anyways. And it's more fun for the faculty to supervise a student in the context of a real problem than, again, some downloaded data set as well. Um, 
The, another thing that you, that you might not be obvious is how much employees value these types of collaborations. I think, you know, certainly at Microsoft, like everybody wanted to work on these projects that were more innovative because on the day-to-day -day basis, they're just sort of doing more routine work. So it's really exciting to build something new. And also, a lot of the, the people who've gone to industry, they also it, very, were very interested in academics and research, and so it's exciting for them. Like, if I bring Emma Brunskill, and they get to say, oh, I get to work with, like, you know, the best person in the world working on reinforcement learning and education, like, they're going to tell their friends, and they're going to be so excited about it, and they're going to learn, and, it, and so that's a huge perk for the employees. It's very motivating, and they'll often work extra and work on the weekends or to, you know, be, just to have that, that pleasure of working on these projects. Projects. Um, and then a, a final thing that, we, that we're finding in one of the, the applications I'll, I'll mention briefly is that for-profit firms also get, get the chance to pursue um, social impact objectives um, without having to take people away from their core business. So um, Dean and I are working on a, a project with a fintech company and we're in our collaboration. It's a for-profit company, um, but we're helping them get people to donate for charity. And so it's hard to justify taking you know, a bunch of machine learning people or data science people off of the for-profit um, component. So even though they have them in the firm, to, to do this social impact project doesn't meet the business objectives. But every, actually, the firm is very excited to do that. And the people in the firm are excited to have a piece of it, but they can do it at lower cost by collaborating with us. OK. Let me um, briefly talk about how we're approaching these projects. And this is really kind of the portfolio approach in, in action. So often the beginning of a project is analytics. You're looking at previous observational data or previous experiments. Then in the innovation stage, you're doing algorithmic development, like figuring out a personalization algorithm or a pilot experiment. In, and then you do maybe design an experiment. You have to develop the KPIs and validate them externally, like make sure that you know, the, 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 the test you're giving in the app matches up with something outside the app that, that really, uh, say, aligns with student outcomes or something like that. You have to formulate your hypothesis test, do pre-analysis planning. Um, it might be, an, and if it's an advanced experiment, like an adaptive experiment, there's nothing off the shelf that tells you exactly how you should expect these things to work. If you're using bandits or other types of, of more advanced algorithms, there's really not a lot of conventional wisdom about how big they have to be and all the things that go wrong. And I've seen a lot of for-profit companies, even with lots of resources, screw up the implementation of adaptive experiments. Um, so that requires some planning and simulation. And then analyze and improve, that's where you get the generalizable insights about what works in general, the tactical insights about what the firm should do next, as well as a new innovation plan. And when I think about the research output, one thing that you can do if you have a, a, a really a portfolio of people is there are lots of different kinds of research output you can get along the way. In the first stage with the analytics, maybe there's a new machine learning method that, and, and maybe the existing machine learning methods are not actually well adapted to the specific kind of data you have. Maybe you have a, a few thousand students and you're watching them interact over a year and there's not, as, there's not the perfect off-the-shelf method. So somebody might be really excited to develop a method that's tailored to that. And of course, that might be useful for other people who have apps with small user bases, but lots of data about how the people are interacting. Um, also, if you're an education scientist, just looking at documenting some facts about that might be really interesting. So at that stage, there's one type of research output. Well, you know, later on, insights about what interventions worked or, or, and the measurement of the efficacy and overall social impact can be important. So by having a portfolio of researchers who are interested in all these things, in, in designing incentives, in, different, in doing different types of methodological research, you can find the right partner who can actually get publisher re publisher research at each stage of the project. And so what we're doing at, in our lab is trying to have a partnership that goes through this whole range of activities so that you can really propose interesting things, but also draw on a portfolio of researchers who would be interested in publishing at different points in this cycle. So th this is really then the portfolio approach, the faculty researchers, um, postdocs who focus on a small number of partners and maintain a consistent relationship, students um, that are, who are guided by postdocs and faculty so that they're not creating a lot of noise for the partner, and then also staff who help with the translation and the dissemination because, of course, the individual academics may not be as interested in making sure that the whole social impact space or investors actually translate that impact. And so that's one of the, th the services we can't really expect the academics to do on their own. So this is, our, this is our kind of dream and agenda to make all of this happen. And it's been actually pretty 
surprising to me how, how appealing that has been to partners. And of course, that's not completely accidental because we've been working with partners to figure out the model. Um, but we have a lot of interesting early successes. Um, some of our partners are here, um, like with Stones to Milestone India. We have Tools for the Mind. Um, we have, you know, all, we've got a partnership with the World Bank. Um, we're, a lot of these, these partnerships are, are well underway, and we're, we're bringing a lot of these tools um, to, to practice. We don't have all the results to show yet because these things take more than a couple of months to get done. But hopefully if you all come back in a couple of years, we'll show you all the ways that we've improved um, the lives of these uh, of, of, our, of the students that we're impacting. Thank you.